Thanks, Josh. Uh, Voyager Therapeutics is a recently founded uh, AAV CNS gene therapy company. We're just a little over one year old, initially focused on severe CNS disorders, disorders of the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord. The lead product programs in our portfolio are a Parkinson's disease program, a program in Friedrich's ataxia, a monogenic recessive disease in which we're replacing the mutant loss of function allele, the uh, frataxin gene, monogenic ALS, a form uh, caused by mutations, gain of function mutations in SOD1, superoxide dismutase 1. It's an antisense um, strategy to knock down that gene, again, in motor neurons in the spinal cord. A Huntington's disease program, which again is, uh, Huntington's disease, as you know, is a dominant disorder caused by mutations in a gene Huntington, a, again, a dominant gain-of-function, toxic gain-of-function mutation, again, a knockdown strategy in that disorder. Lots of, uh, I think, very compelling preclinical data suggesting uh, that these strategies will work uh, if, of course, we can deliver the gene uh, to the right cell type at the right time. And then there's an undisclosed CNS program based on our recent collaboration and alliance announced recently with Genzyme. We also are very interested in advancing the area of vector engineering caps, capsid design. We talked about this this morning. Uh, we believe that we can come up with better vectors that are, than are currently available. The ones right now we think are good enough to get started, and we've shown that in our own work, and there's abundant literature that suggests that. But we believe we're, uh, able, we're going to be able to engineer these capsids uh, to provide better delivery of our transgenes, our payload genes, to the CNS, and we believe to other tissues as well. Uh, we've invested uh, for a startup very heavily in process research and development, the process we're using to produce baculovirus, uh, AV virus at scale is the baculovirus SF9 system, uh, same process, by the way, that's used to produce Glybera, the Unicure product. We think it's scalable and we can produce both research grade vector and GMP grade, grade vector, high quality vector at scale. We've actually recruited the inventor of that process, a fellow named Rob Cotton from the NIH to join Voyager and have that set up and running as we speak. Dosing and delivery become important and we've invested very heavily in delivery technology, both directly into the brain, intraparenchymal delivery into the brain, but also intrathecal delivery to be able to get the vector and transgene to the right cells in the right tissues, in this case, the spinal cord uh, and the brain parenchyma, the, the putamen. We believe a lot of this platform is going to be applicable across therapeutic areas and provide us uh, with some broad intellectual property on many of these novel capsids and delivery technologies. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, just to sort of cut to the chase on the founders. We've, um, we've brought in some just terrific people to help uh, guide the company, both internally but also externally, and uh, very, very proud of the team we brought on. Uh, people like Guangping Gao, who's discovered most of the, the serotypes currently being used, the AV serotypes currently being used. Mark Kay at Stanford, who's engineered a variety of novel capsids uh, and has done a lot of work in the hemophilia space, but now focused with us on CNS. Chris uh, Bankowitz, who's a neurosurgeon at UCSF, who's pioneered the Parkinson's approach that we're taking and has uh, uh, been helpful in getting that up and running uh, with us and for us. And then uh, Phil Zamor, who's a uh, Howard Hughes investigator at the University of Massachusetts, a terrific RNA biologist who brings to the company some extraordinary microRNA technology for knocking down genes. Uh, just a comment maybe, Josh, about the Genzyme collaboration, a very broad a strategic collaboration. Uh, we uh, drive the bus, so to speak. We are driving the R&D through completion of the initial clinical studies. Uh, from a, a financing perspective, uh, this brought us $100 million uh, up front, uh, $65 million in cash and $30 million in equity and some in-kind assets as well with a number of milestones obviously built in uh, to each and every one of these programs. Importantly, uh, <clears throat> we retain U.S. rights to the major programs, the major product programs, including our Parkinson's program, the Friedrichs program, uh, and then uh, Huntington's, they have an opt-in right for co-promote in the U.S. Uh, we 
keep our ALS program completely unencumbered, and then for the undisclosed program, uh, there is, uh, uh, again, uh, buy-in rights, and they, they retain, uh, we get royalties, they retain worldwide rights to that program. So that is basically the company. Maybe we could put that last slide back up. I don't know if there's another one in there. Uh, let's see. That's it. Okay. Right. Why don't we grab that mic? And why don't we, um, why don't we, we dwell on the, the agreement with Sanofi? It's, I, I mean, I think it's one of the bigger ones I've seen in, in gene therapy and fascinating that, that Genzyme, who's been dabbling in gene therapy, I mean, they were one of the original dabblers in gene sure. therapy, kind of recognized that they weren't going to get there on their own. So maybe give us a little bit of history as to how that collaboration started and, and how you're able to get such, such terrific terms. Yeah, let me just say from the outset, we're very, very pleased to be collaborating with Genzyme, Sanofi. Genzyme, of course, as Josh mentioned, has been actually in the gene therapy for quite some time, uh, perhaps earlier than almost any other biggish company, and have uh, a lot of assets, uh, some IP, uh, know-how that we brought together uh, into this alliance. Um, so we're real pleased to be working with them. In fact, the Parkinson's program that we've brought in-house is actually arguably an early program in their portfolio as well. So they're very excited about what we brought to the table and working together to really drive these programs uh, to the next key in, you know, value inflection points, clinical data, and then eventually, hopefully, uh, to patients, to the market. So. You know, again, uh, couldn't be more pleased to, to have the partner there. They're in Cambridge, uh, very close to where we are. Uh, we've already begun to get together with them on each and every one of these programs, and uh, there's a lot of good chemistry uh, that's developing. We also um, can access a, an alternate uh, production process, uh, stable cell line production, that they've developed uh, at Genzyme over the years. Uh, to sort of complement what we're doing with baculovirus. And of course, we're kind of agnostic to um, which process we use. We just want to use a process that's um, robust and high quality and that can produce vector at the scales that we need to produce. That varies, of course, uh, from indication to indication. But was there a relationship with Genzyme and Voyager to begin with? I mean, you're both in Cambridge, so maybe. Uh, not <laughs> really. I do think uh, a number of the scientists that we've recruited to Voyager, for example, uh, Dinah Sa, who's our senior vice president of neuroscience, who spent a good portion of her career at, um, uh, at El Nylum, actually, and has worked on Huntington's disease, well, well known to the Voyager science, uh, to the Genzyme scientists. So there are three or four scientists that we brought on board that, you know, quite frankly, are well known in the, uh, in the space of, you know, gene therapy broadly defined. And so that certainly didn't, uh, didn't hurt. I think um, what developed, and as you know, these discussions and negotiations can take a long time. I mean, we literally met with them for, I would say, at least a year or so. Uh, and there were lots of meetings on details around the science and directions that we would take, directions that they've taken. And I think as a result of those meetings, it became clear that working together, uh, we we're going to make a lot more progress than working separately, and that for them, this was a way of realizing their vision for gene therapy, which, is, as you know, started quite a few years ago. So at the, at the panel, we talked about biomarkers and I let you off the hook because, okay. <laughs> because you had a great answer for the Parkinson's yeah. program and the biomarkers there, but then you kind of glossed over the other programs as not being so straightforward. Yeah. How, do, how do you think, I mean, for, as, you, as the, you know, the CNS is not necessarily the yeah. easiest target for delivery, how do you know that you're on the right track when you make the jump from an animal into the human? Yeah, so uh, sort of the answer to the question depends what information you want the biomarkers to help you with. So with respect to target engagement, being able to deliver the transgene with the vector, I mentioned the Parkinson's program because, you know, I think there it's a very clear path forward. Here's what the marker will tell us. We have pharmacodynamic endpoints in addition to clinical endpoints. With respect to some of the other programs, we're going to be looking very carefully at um, what we can measure in cerebral spinal fluid. So if we take for tax, and we know we can deliver it to the spinal cord, dorsal root ganglia. And the question becomes, can we measure 
free for taxin, let's say in exosomes or other things in the CSF, that will give us evidence that we're actually delivering the transgene, transgene uh, to, the, to the right tissue. And we can, in the animal studies, we can differentiate you know, let's say human for taxin, which is what we're delivering in the monkey, from monkey for taxin, and get an idea based on what amount of for taxin is being expressed, let's say, in DRGs or spinal cord neurons, uh, with what is floating around in the CSF, let's say, in the form of an exosome or something along that line. Um, there are a number of, of very good, what I'll call, markers of disease progression in a number of these neuromuscular diseases. And so, we, we have semi-objective quantitative ways of tracking the progression of the disease short of, you know, measuring clinical endpoints or clinical symptoms. So those will be helpful as well. Um, but as you, as you know, you're dealing with uh, intact tissue and uh, it, it's, it's a bit more challenging. There's no, there's no question about that. So as we speak, my team is knee deep in amyloid, trying to understand the connection with, with Alzheimer's and Having the, the PET scan to, to measure brain amyloid yeah. really has, has changed the ability to, to optimize therapeutics. To, to what extent do you either see a comparable opportunity to develop PET scan diagnostics, or to what extent do you see the opportunity to pursue yeah. specifically a disease where you have that kind of marker almost for the purpose of making sure you're doing it right yeah. and getting, getting yeah. it right? So, so I spent about 20 years before I joined Voyager working on in the area of Alzheimer's disease, and we're still working on that. I'm an inventor of, um, co-inventor of Lilly's uh, phase three uh, compound solanezumab. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about amyloid and uh, what it what it really measures. And I must say, um, I'm not yet convinced that removing amyloid from the brain, which intuitively sounds good. Uh, necessarily is a marker that the treatments are working. Uh, so just, you can, <laughs> you can capture that for your analysis. Uh, there's very little evidence of that, by the way. There's very little evidence that the amount of amyloid in the brain, and again, I'm a, I, I'm a believer that amyloid's very important as a, as a, a kind of a, a trigger for the disease. Uh, there's very little evidence that the amount of amyloid really determines much in the way of the downstream pathology. 30% of people over the age of 70 have as much amyloid in their brain as anybody with Alzheimer's disease and they're cognitively normal. Having said that, I'm a bigger believer of, 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 of tau imaging and that is a marker of disease progression and that data is starting to look very, very exciting. So I do think that biomarkers are very important but you know, I think you know, they're very difficult to validate. I mean, it's taken us a long time to validate LDL cholesterol as a biomarker, hemoglobin A1C. You know, you need multiple drugs to show the clinical effects that then can, in essence, validate the biomarkers that can then allow the biomarkers to be useful for future studies. So I, it's a long-winded answer, Josh, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, not to say anything about biomarkers, but I think, I think for us, if we can, in a large species like a monkey, for example, we can deliver the genes that we know we need to deliver to replace in the case of Friedrichs or knockdown in the case of SOD1 ALS uh, to the, rec, you know, the important neurons that are, we know are degenerating in those disorders. But before those neurons degenerate, early enough in the course of the disease, I think we've got a really good shot at, at treating these diseases. The, the key endpoints in many of those cases is going to be disease progression over a period of 6 or 12 or 18 months, and I think that's where the whole thing's going to be. Won or lost. And maybe one last question in the time remaining. Um, you talked about vector optimization. Yeah. Just help us understand what that means in the CNS. How, how do you, I mean, if you want to target the astrocyte and you've got, yeah. you know, AAV8 or AAV9 as right. your starting point, how do you then engineer it to do what you want it to do? Well, right now, the whole thing is very empirical. We basically, in this, we, the field, we, Voyager, have administered these vectors um, to the CSF, for example, or to the systemic circulation. And we've just looked at how much vector gets into brain and how well these genes express. Some of them do better than others. And so what we're doing is a bunch of phenotypic screening, barcoding experiments, et cetera, to actually find vectors that are better and worse and then be able to piece together what is it about the sequences of those capsids that determine that. But what we're also finding right now, quite frankly, are vectors that are better than 
uh, others, and they look pretty good. Now, how do you then uh, get them to express their genes only in specific cell types? That you need to do with promoters and, and, and other sorts of things. One, one thing I neglected to mention, I know we're getting, running a bit out of time, is the use of AV to actually deliver antibodies to the brain. This is a very exciting area. Uh, we've succeeded in doing this with a very important antibody that we think might affect the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And frankly, I think this is going to be a, a, a very interesting future direction. Very exciting. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I think we're ready for our next company presentation, TXL. Thank you, Steve.